Hi there class, this is the next video for Finance 6310 Advanced Venture Capital. Here's the agenda for this video. It's really comprised of two parts. The first parts will follow on with some of the key historical backdrop that underpins modern venture capital investing. We'll discuss how long memories of a hedge fund called long-term capital management eventually played a role in tipping the dominoes of the 2008 financial crisis. And I'll give you a primer on the events that kicked off the Great Recession, the most significant confluence of world financial events of our generation. Then I'll walk you through the hidden reasons a VC might pass on an investment. These are reasons which a VC is unlikely to share with founders and which in many cases are entirely outside the founder's control. So, we've spoken briefly about several acts of Congress and how they've influenced the financial playing field. The full story of how politics mesh with finance is way beyond the scope of this course, but you need to know that what happens politically does have an impact on your chances for success as an entrepreneur and as a financier of entrepreneurs. So we'll hit the highlights from the past 85 years that are still a major influence on how investing is done today. We've already discussed how FDR signed the Securities, uh, the Securities and Securities and Exchange Acts as part of the New Deal. One more act you should know about from this period is called the Glass-Steagall Act. Glass-Steagall created a separation between commercial and investment banking. If you are a bank focused on commercial banking, you are prohibited from acting as an investment bank. This makes sense in the context of the day. We're talking about a few short years since the stock market crash of 1929, and in the previous video we mentioned all the runs on the bank that ensued. The government really wanted to separate the regular banking system from the stock market, and Glass-Steagall is how they did it. Now fast forward another 43 years. The country has gone through World War II, it's in the throes of a post-war nuclear arms race and the Cold War, which provide the motivation for fateful international decisions seen in events like the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Vietnam War. Domestically, the civil rights movement has rippled through the entire period. President Kennedy has been assassinated along with his brother Robert Kennedy and, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. As a result of his actions exposed at Watergate, Richard Nixon resigns and his vice president, Gerald Ford, is succeeded by Jimmy Carter. During Carter's time, banks are coming under scrutiny for the practice of redlining. Effectively, redlining means that banks were using your address as an underwriting criteria when you went in to get a loan. It just so happened that if you lived in a poor area, you had a harder time getting a loan, and you were more likely to be a minority. Redlining was called out as racism against minorities based on the neighborhoods they lived in. The Community Reinvestment Act did not even the playing field by requiring banks to use standard fair underwriting criteria irrespective of where you lived. Instead, it banned the practice of redlining, which is good, and went further in requiring banks to make a certain number of loans to people who were less qualified for loans. The intent was to help minorities by giving more loans to them. If banks did not comply, they could lose their FDIC insurance. At the time, the CRA had only a very limited impact on the economy or on banking in general, but everybody got to feel good that they had evened the playing field a little. But the idea of requiring some loans to be made which were lower quality from a risk perspective in order to retain your FDIC insurance would set a dangerous precedent. During Ronald Reagan's time, a Tax Reform Act was passed. This is probably the biggest tax reform still affecting how we pay our taxes today outside of Obamacare. This was the shift to monetarism, and in addition to personal taxes, this law reformed how investing activities like capital gains were taxed. Also during Reagan's time, in the world of real estate, we had the savings and loan crisis. At that time, savings and loan companies effectively acted like banks. They took deposits and issued home mortgages. During the Carter administration, the Federal Reserve had raised interest rates dramatically to curb inflation. This caused one-third of all the savings and loans in the United States to fail. The RTC was a government entity formed to sell off the assets of the failed savings and loans. If you talk to any old dog in real estate who was active during those times, they'll talk about the old RTC days when this was happening. Because as those assets were selling, they were depressing the price of real estate. This sets a precedent for how the mortgage industry will change over the next few decades. During Bill Clinton's time, he signed a bill called the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, which repealed the Glass-Steagall prohibition on banks operating as both commercial and investment banks. Now the bank you used for your checking account could participate in investment banking like the big investment banks on Wall Street. Speaking of Wall Street, some fun things were happening during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Let me introduce you to some very smart guys. This is Robert Merton from MIT. Robert Merton from MIT and Myron Scholes from Stanford. 
and this is Fisher Black from Harvard and MIT. In 1973, Black and Scholes published a paper called The Pricing of Options and Corporate Liabilities, in which they introduced the famous Black-Scholes model used to deduce the Black-Scholes formula, which looks like this, and gives us a pretty close approximation of how option prices are estimated. This was revolutionary in its day for options trading. Now, Merton was not listed as a co-author in the 1973 paper, but through the 1990s, all three are becoming increasingly famous, culminating in Merton and Scholes winning the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1997. So these guys are like the financial rock stars of their day. Meanwhile, this guy, John C. Merriweather, is a bond trader for Solomon Brothers. He rises to the position of vice chairman and head of trading within Solomon Brothers. As a result of some misstatements from a subordinate, which led to an SEC investigation, Merriweather leaves Solomon Brothers and creates a hedge fund. For his new hedge fund, he recruits a number of the all-stars from Solomon Brothers and other top-shelf talent, including dun -dun -dun, these guys. And they call their hedge fund Long-Term Capital Management, or LTCM. LTCM uses all these sophisticated models and formulas from some of the best minds on the planet, as well as relationships with Merrill Lynch and Bear Stearns, and they are killing it. They're focused on a specific type of fixed income security and the arbitrage, the arbitrage between these and treasuries. Because they're doing so well, more and more people want to invest with them. But they're running out of the fixed income type deals that are their bread and butter. And that's causing them problems deploying all the capital that they're raising. So they go looking in other places to deploy capital. And they expand into international versions of the deals they're running domestically. Unfortunately, just as Merton and Scholes are being awarded their Nobel Prize, the Asian financial crisis hits in 1997, followed by the Russian financial crisis in 1998. As a result, LTCM is caught off guard by the turbulence in these international markets and gets sucker punched. And it starts to lose money. In September of 1998, Goldman Sachs and Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway offered a buyout LTCM for $3.75 billion, which seems like a ton of money, but it's almost a billion less than LTCM was valued at in January of the same year. Warren Buffett gives Meriwether one hour to make up his mind. Meriwether ends up passing on the offer. He banks on the fact that LTCM is the darling of Wall Street. They know everybody, and he reaches out to seek help from others. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York orchestrates a bailout of creditors and Wall Street players to try to save LTCM. Note the precedent of bailouts for big Wall Street financial institutions. Bear Stearns, one of the big five investment banks and a key partner of LTCM, conspicuously declines to participate. Ultimately, LTCM loses $4.6 billion. They'd only been worth 4.7 at the beginning of the year. It's a colossal failure, and all of the bailout participants lose money big time. LTCM is one key background element which I'll tie into the meltdown of 2008. But what else contributed to the meltdown of the players in the financial markets? In October of 2008, I wrote this paper on the meltdown, which occurred only in September, the month before. It's available on Canvas to those of you who are interested in exploring this in more detail. During the mid-1990s, while LTCM is still having its good run, a new kind of company is shaking things up on Wall Street. Internet companies. Internet stocks are growing like crazy, and these companies seem to not behave like traditional companies. As a result, their valuations keep rising higher and higher. Veterans of the market are seeing these ever-rising valuations, and they are getting nervous. In December of 1996, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan gives a speech to a public policy research group in which he warns, how do we know when irrational exuberance has unduly escalated asset values, which then become subject to unexpected and prolonged contractions? This phrase, irrational exuberance, gets repeated, and there's even a book written about it. But this is his warning sign that things are getting a little crazy. The markets barely acknowledge Greenspan's warning with a slight blip in values before climbing higher in what would become known as the dot-com bubble. Companies during this time were known to say things like traditional methods of valuation like revenue and earnings are outdated. They wanted to be evaluated on things like website traffic, average daily clicks, and website stickiness. 
Greenspan acknowledges this valuation confusion, saying the markets are groping for the appropriate valuations of these companies. But he further warns investors in these companies that speculating is not necessarily the same as investing. Greenspan is telegraphing that he thinks there's a lot of froth in the market and that investors getting pulled into investing in dot-com companies may be getting suckered. He doesn't like this state of affairs at all. And unlike just about every other person in the country, Greenspan can actually do something about this. And so he begins to raise interest rates. The rate goes up almost two points between August of 1999 and May of 2000. And what happens? The bubble bursts. Internet stocks begin to free fall. Typically, markets lag interest rate hikes by about six months. This is no exception. Rates begin to rise in August of 99, and the market peaks in early 2000. The NASDAQ would ultimately lose 70% of its value. The Dow and S&P would each take six or seven years to recover the value they lost from this period. Seeing this bursting bubble, Greenspan tries to react by lowering rates in early 2001. He didn't want to cause this big of a swing in the economy. But it's too little too late. The market has already lost over $5 trillion in value. But that's not the worst of it. In the midst of the market attempting a rally, weak though it was, came the terrorist attacks of 9-11. The economy collapses. With values continuing to plunge, the Fed will lower interest rates to below 1% by November of 2002, a 45-year low. Investors now totally pummeled by the markets just want out. They exit whatever way they can and hold cash on the sidelines. But over time, holding that cash isn't much consolation. With interest rates below 1% and inflation at 2 to 3%, cash holdings are devaluing the longer things go. Investors start to feel the pressure to put their money to work somewhere, but they're still scared and risk averse. They start to turn their attention to real estate. Real estate's a hard asset, its value will never go to zero. Even through the depression, real estate appreciated over the long haul. Greenspan also sees the merits of real estate and encourages the financial markets to develop financial products that would make it easier for people to buy homes. And there were political motives. Scandals at Enron and WorldCom continued to undermine faith in the economy. Bush and Green Bush and Greenspan thought new financial products would increase home ownership, a pillar of the American dream, and encourage home equity borrowing. If people could pull money out of their homes, they would hopefully spend it in the economy and aid the post-9-11 economic recovery. Now, remember the SNLs and the RTC? Well, after this period, banks stopped carrying home loans themselves. They, they would write loans and then they would sell the mortgages off to the secondary mortgage market. The largest players in the secondary mortgage market are two quasi-governmental companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These two held half of the $12 trillion in U.S. mortgage debt. The secondary mortgage market also reduces the need for banks in the mortgage loan process. Specialized mortgage companies, the same as we see today, rise up whose sole job is to generate loans which they bundle up and sell off in large blocks to the secondary market. A few years earlier, President Clinton had revived the CRA and encouraged Fannie and Freddie to accept loans from less creditworthy borrowers. Studies indicated that it would still be profitable to include some of these along with the A paper loans. Since subprime mortgages could be sold on the secondary market now, mortgage companies had greater incentives to issue them. The mortgage companies themselves assumed none of the risk for these subprime loans. As a result, the loans started to be issued to less creditworthy borrowers. Folks were getting loans that mortgage brokers called ninjas for no job, no assets, or loans given on stated income, which became known as liar loans. Investment bankers see what's going on, and they create a financial product called a collateralized mortgage obligation, or CMO. Essentially, they took a bundle of mortgages and allowed investors to invest in a bond attached to the bundle of mortgages. Investors got to invest in a way they were used to, but with the added benefit that their investment was backed by real estate instead of the ephemeral promises of the dot-coms. CMOs just needed insurance and a credit rating. They easily obtained AAA ratings from rating agencies like Fitch's, Moody's, and Standard & Poor's. Firms that had expertise in valuing stocks and bonds, but no experience assessing the risk of default on real estate. And CMOs sold like hotcakes. Everybody wanted to buy them. 
all that cash that had been sitting on the sidelines rushed back into the market to purchase these CMOs that were supposedly safer because they're backed by real estate. They were even popular among the investment banks themselves. So these guys are drinking their own Kool-Aid. And many of the investment banks borrow extensively just to invest in CMOs. As a result, the pull-through demand for mortgages goes through the roof. There's more demand than there are creditworthy borrowers, so even more subprime loans get made. In order to get borrowers into bigger and bigger homes, these were the days of the so-called McMansions, many of these loans were written as adjustable rate mortgages or ARMS. Since interest rates were at historic lows, this made monthly payments more affordable, and everybody thought traditional real estate economics would hold even through this type of market manipulation. All this demand caused a construction boom, pulling another sector of the economy into, the, into its vortex. Now Greenspan, like Dr. Frankenstein seeing his monster, starts to see the enormity of the effect real estate is having and gets worried again that this monster of his own making might be getting out of control. He starts to raise interest rates to curb the insanity. He panics and raises rates 17 times in 24 months. Rising interest rates are devastating to the arms, and rising payments as a result price people out of the homes they're living in. Since home values are falling, nobody can sell their home except at a loss. They're all underwater. Normal avenues for correction in the market have been closed. By 2006 to 2007, the writing is on the wall, and foreclosures start mounting. The normally safe real estate investment has turned toxic. And the plight of homeowners is coming home to roost with Wall Street, Leveraged investment banks, which is all of them, are in trouble. The market for CMOs dries up overnight. Since the banks can't trade in their most popular product, they hit a major liquidity crisis. Now, investing at this time is dominated by the big five, Goldman Sachs, Bear Stearns, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, and Lehman Brothers. In March of 2008, Bear Stearns hits the wall with zero liquidity from its portfolio of CMOs. As it begins to crumble, it sends out a distress call asking for help from its peers and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. But memories of the cold shoulder that Bear gave to the LTCM bailout burn bright. Nobody steps up to help Bear, except the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which assists in a sale of Bear Stearns to J.P. Morgan. On Monday, St. Patrick's Day of 2008, Bear Stearns sells to J.P. Morgan for $2 a share, a 98% discount to its trading price the previous Friday. Unfortunately, the carnage isn't limited to Bear. In September of 2008, Lehman Brothers goes under. Merrill Lynch is then purchased by Bank of America in distress. Morgan Stanley is effectively purchased by the largest bank in Japan. Of the original Big Five, only Goldman Sachs is left standing after the meltdown. In response to the craziness, President Bush doubles down on his return to Keynesian economics from the year before, and he does so with a $475 billion stimulus package called TARP, the largest stimulus package of its kind ever. Not to be outdone, in the following year, President Obama is uh, inaugurated and follows the Bush stimulus with an $831 billion stimulus package of his own and several enormous regulatory bills. Now where we stand, it's nearly 10 years since all of this went down, but it still burns bright in the minds of those who went through it, including VCs and other investors who are active in the marketplace today. Okay, that covers the economic and historical parts of the course. The remainder of this video is about why VCs say no, and especially the reasons that they're unlikely to tell you. Now, we'll cover the top 12 reasons VCs say no that they most often don't tell you. Number one, VCs may say no if you aren't swinging for the fences. At this point in the course, you understand that VC investing is a risky proposition. Most startups don't make it. Therefore, most VC investments turn out to be failures. For a VC to make money, the few winners have to make up for a lot of losers. Marketing and advertising pioneer John Wanamaker said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I just don't know which half. Well, VCs are in a similar boat, trying to figure out which companies in their portfolio are going to be those all-important winners. You've got to at least look like your company could be a big winner. 
In other words, if you aren't swinging for the fences, VCs literally can't afford to consider investing in your company. In that case, it's easy to calculate your probability of hitting a home run and of getting VC investment. Zero. Number two, hard to, it's hard to make a living at the horse track. Venture investing is somewhat like betting on horses. It's not purely gambling. In horse racing, you can learn how to judge horse flesh and jockeys, and the right odds can set you up for a windfall. But it's very hard to consistently pick winners, and you lose more often than you win. With startups, it isn't just about telling a good one from a bad one. All startups are by nature riddled with flaws that could become fatal. There's always a genuine reason not to invest. Take this website from Bessemer called The Anti-Portfolio. Bessemer claims to be one of the oldest venture capital firms in the world, and they post this list of deals they passed on as a way of illustrating how fallible they are and just how hard it is to be prescient about which deals win. No matter how good your deal is, there's a reason to say no. I'll highlight just a few. So down here at the bottom you can see Apple. Uh, Bessemer had the opportunity to invest in pre-IPO secondary stock in Apple at a $60 million valuation. Now think about that. This is the most valuable company in the world by market cap right now. Bessemer's Neil Brownstein called it outrageously expensive, valued at $60 million. Or how about eBay? Stamps, coins, comic books? You've got to be kidding. No-brainer pass. Or Facebook. Jeremy Levine spent a weekend at a corporate retreat in the summer of 2004 dodging persistent Harvard undergrad Eduardo Severin's rabid pitch. Finally, cornered in a lunch line, Jeremy delivered some sage advice. Kid, haven't you heard of Friendster? Move on, it's over. Or how about FedEx? Incredibly, BVP passed on FedEx seven times. Or Google. I mean, how can it be bigger than passing on Google? Cowan's, Cowan's one of their partners. Cowan's college friend rented her garage to Sergey and Larry for their first year. In 1999 and 2000, she tried to introduce Cowan to these two really smart Stanford students riding a search engine. Students, a new search engine? In the most important moment ever for Bessemer's anti-portfolio, Cowan asked her, how can I get out of this house without going anywhere near your garage? Or how about PayPal? David Cowan passed on the Series A round. Rookie team, regulatory nightmare. And four years later, a $1.5 billion acquisition by eBay. Or Tesla. In 2006, Byron Dieter met the team and test drove a Roadster. He put a deposit on the car, but passed on the negative margin company, telling his partners, it's a win-win. I get a great car and some other VC pays for it. The company passed $30 billion in market cap in 2014. And Byron recently paid full price for his Model X. The moral of the story is that VCs are justifiably picky, and there's always a legitimate reason to say no. That's tough to swallow when you're a founder and something outside your control prevents you from getting the money you need to grow your company. But often founders just need to accept that the rationale may or may not be there and it may or may not make sense to them. Sometimes you just got to move on. Number three, the cream didn't rise or didn't rise fast enough. You've probably gathered by now that VCs have to be on the lookout for big winners. Sometimes the reason a VC says no is because it wasn't obvious enough, fast enough, that your company might be one of these big winners. But sometimes it's the competition for that exclusive top spot that makes the difference. Remember, VCs screen a lot of deals, but invest in relatively few. If your company is the third best deal they're reviewing, you might get a pass. If your company is awesome, but just not the top choice among the deals the VC is evaluating right now, that can be the difference between getting investment or not. If it takes too long, or for some reason your company doesn't rise to the top of the list, it's likely the VC will pass. You're probably not going to know who you are competing against, or what the factors were that ultimately tipped the scales against you. Since there isn't a lot you can do about that, your best bet is to stay focused on relentlessly building the best company you can. Number four, you lost momentum. Momentum matters in the VC community. A sense of inevitability around your company builds fear of, fear of missing out, FOMO, and signals to investors that yours is a train that they need to be on. Momentum matters both in your company's pace for hitting milestones and the critical mass of your relationship with prospective investors. Now, don't be annoying, but don't allow the pace of your contact and interaction to stall out. That can be a difficult line to walk and means you have a lot of timing issues to navigate. What's your timing in the market? What's the timing of your company's milestones? Where's the urgency? And where should it be? 
When we were raising a Series A for a company I was with, we started in this awkward phase where our ARR, right, our annual recurring revenue, was on track to be 200% year over year of what we'd done the year before. And we just inked a key partnership deal that would double our revenue for the year. The problem, these revenues were tied to the academic calendar and wouldn't materialize until that fall, eight months later. Key performance measures were in place, the work was done, and nothing else was required on our part but the timing was off for us to show the momentum we felt inside the company. Ultimately, we used the spring and summer period to plant seeds with prospective investors and painfully waited until fall to kick our fundraising into high gear. This allowed us to paint an up-and-coming story with investors, which was borne out as the revenues we had secured materialized. We easily could have made the mistake of going out to raise without momentum, which would have been injurious to the business and our fundraising prospects. The bottom line is that VCs are human beings. Human beings sometimes behave like magpies and are quickly distracted by shiny new things. If your deal slips into the old news category, you have a much harder job of trying to breathe life and excitement back into it in order to secure investment. Number five, no dry powder. The timing within the life cycle of a VC fund affects how deals are evaluated. A typical VC fund is created with a 10-year lifespan. We talked about this in the last video. The first half of the fund, both in time and dollars, is for making new investments, while the latter half is for follow-on investing and pushing deals to exit in order to finalize returns to the fund's investors as the fund draws to a close. A new fund is raised each two to four years. As a result, VCs often don't have a constant availability of capital to invest. There are questions like, would this deal fit better in the new fund we're raising than the one we're in? Is this deal appropriate for that final deal to cap this fund off? Is the VC distracted by issues related to raising the new fund? All of this means two things to founders. First, the life cycle timing of a fund can affect the attractiveness of your deal to the fund. It's important. Second, there's only one way to discover anything about a particular VC's fund life cycle, and that is to ask them. In my experience, it's really uncommon for this information to be volunteered, but it's generously offered when asked. VCs are constantly on the lookout for great deals, so they won't necessarily balk at taking a call or appointment with you, even if they have no dry powder to make an investment. So you want to find out early on, does the VC have dry powder? If they don't, there's a good chance they'll tell you no. Number six, the Goldilocks principle. When a VC fund is created, it has a set of governing documents, a charter or an operating or partnership agreement, which spells out how the fund will operate. VCs typically focus on a fairly narrow band in terms of investment amount, as correlated to company stage. A minimum or maximum investment size may be spelled out in the documents, such as no single investment will be over $5 million, or, uh, or a no investment will be greater than a certain percentage of the total size of the fund. As a result, VCs can't have their deals too big or too small. Just like Goldilocks, the deal size needs to be just right. Find out whether the amount you're looking to raise is within the allowable and typical deal size for the VC. If you're outside the sweet spot, they may have no choice to, but to say no. A good way to discover this is go to their website, look at the press releases about deals they've done, see what kind of amounts they've invested in the past. Number seven, industry alignment. VC fund documents or management philosophy may limit investment activity to certain industries. VC, VC firms may choose to invest only in technology companies, for example, such as Greylock Partners famously does. Or maybe they focus on software as a service or biotech, medical devices, real estate, um, B2B manufacturing, etc. If a VC isn't active in your space, then you're wasting your time asking them to invest in your company. The key is to know what sectors your VC is active in so they don't have to tell you no and you can focus your energy on investors where you have industry alignment. Number eight, you're in the wrong place. VCs may limit their investing to certain geographies. You need to approach those who are investing in your area or move your company to a place where investors are active. The highest concentration of VCs is on the coasts. Silicon Valley in Northern California has more VC activity than any place else in the world bar none. In the east, New York and Boston are the hubs. Some VCs in these areas will invest anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world, but some like to stay close to home. Less prominent communities still may have a strong startup ecosystem, such as Austin, Texas, or right here in Salt Lake City. Um, it's typical for these communities, however, to have more local funding for early investments like Series C and Series A, while often companies must turn toward the coasts when it's time to raise a larger round. In any case, being in the wrong place is a reason that VCs say no. 
Number nine, the portfolio mix. As a founder, a round of investment is a singular thing. You raise money one round at a time. You aren't often raising multiple rounds at once. But this is not true for your investor. VCs invest the capital from their funds in a portfolio of companies, while invisible to you, the relationship between companies in the portfolio can be very important to the VC. They may have already invested in a competitor, in which case they're unlikely to fund you. Or they may be looking for synergies between portfolio companies where there's a mutual benefit. They may be looking for companies to shore up other dynamics between portfolio companies, such as exit horizon, access to talent, or access to technology. If they don't see what they're looking for in terms of portfolio construction, that can be a reason you get a no. Number 10, an ugly capital stack. The required capital structure changes to clean up an ugly capital stack can add time, legal expense, and po the potential for existing shareholders who are unsupportive of corrective measures. Messiness, prospective hassle, and expense are turnoffs for investors. Capital structure corrections are common, but given the choice between otherwise equal uh, but given the choice between otherwise equal companies, one that requires extensive correction to its capital structure and one that doesn't, VCs are likely to avoid the hassle. Cleaning a messy capital structure is something you may want to tackle before you approach investors. If an IPO is the potential exit, your capital stack may contain problems that need to be fixed before the price of your shares and the number of shares required for the public float are right for a successful entry into the public markets. Number 11, lack of social proof. VCs, like the rest of us, are influenced by those around them. Whether it's recommendations on Amazon or Yelp reviews, we feel more confident in making decisions when we see others making the same decision. Psychologists tell us that we're wired to look to others for signals as to what the correct behavior is in any situation. So social proof comes into play in at least two ways, introductions and initial investments. As a founder or entrepreneur, it's better to get an introduction to investors than to just send cold emails or walk up to someone and introduce yourself to, at a conference. An introduction comes with the tacit recommendation of the one making it, a subconscious disarming that says, hey, this new person is okay. Some of the best introductions can come from a current investor or a warm introduction from the CEO of one of the investor's portfolio companies. If you can get either of those, that's the best. When it comes to first investments, I've seen this time and again, no investor wants to be the first kid in the pool. It's much easier to invest when another investor is already in the deal or when you know others are seriously looking. Remember that scene from Silicon Valley where the phone call from Peter Gregory motivates Gavin Belson to dramatically up his offer? This is poking fun at how dramatically social proof influences investors. Now the show might be fiction, but the principle is spot on. You're far better off to have interest from at least one other investor when you start your conversations in earnest. Interest from the first prospective investor adds immeasurably to the comfort of those who follow. Ideally, you got two or more investors chasing you right up through your first investment, providing the confidence to each other that your company is a hot item. Conversely, lack of social proof makes VCs afraid everyone else knows something they don't, and they wonder why nobody else is interested. Either way, lack of social proof can be the reason you get a no. Number 12, you're missing a champion within. As you build a relationship with a VC firm, you're likely to meet multiple people at the firm who are serving in various roles. It's common for VCs to have an investment committee where partners sponsor prospective deals. Throughout the process, you need to establish someone inside the firm to be your champion. This is the person who's likely to go to bat for your company and win internal support for issuing a term sheet and shepherding your deal through the due diligence process to funding. Make sure that your champion never regrets sticking his or her neck out for your company. Lacking a champion within, your chances are far greater that you'll come away with a no. Now I said there were only 12, and I've highlighted 12 reasons VCs say no, but sometimes you need to say no as well, so I've included this as a bonus reason. One of the hardest things for a founder is to turn down bad money, especially if you've pursued a long process with a VC. It can be hard to say no when the term sheet comes in. You want to remember that if you sell 30 or 40% of your company, that means your company needs to generate an extra 30 or 40% in return when it sells just for you to break even where you would have been if you hadn't taken investment. Sometimes bigger isn't always better. I recently heard of two local companies. One raised lots of money as it grew, and it ended up selling to a Fortune 500 software company for almost $2 billion. A success story for sure. The other also grew quickly, but chose to avoid raising money and ended up selling for less than $200 million. But here's the kicker. The founder of the second company took home more money in the sale of the company than did the founder of the first. 
Understanding your ultimate goals and what is reasonable for a company like yours can help inform your sense of when terms represent workable compromises versus unreasonable requests. You should know when something is a deal breaker for you. Always remember, it can be terrible to be tied to bad money. All right, that's it for this video. I'll see you on the next video.